Hello. <laughs> How are you? Hello, bonjour. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> nice to talk to you. Yes. Oh, I can talk to you if you wish. What's that behind you on the wall? So this is like, a, oh, that's a very good question. Yeah. <laughs> This is a, a, a Buddha abroad from Tibet, a pilgrimage yeah. I've done there in 2003. So it yeah. was like more than 15 years ago. Yeah. And this is like co uh, book covers, sci-fi book covers from uh, mm -hmm. Frank Herbert, a, a novel called uh, Dune. Huh. So he, uh, there's also a David Lynch uh, movie uh, yes. adapted from that novel. Uh -huh. So yeah, that's my office. I see. So my uh, name is your Ludwig name Mohammed. Aha. Uh -huh. What an interesting name. So yeah, you're German you. and Iranian, huh? <laughs> Almost. I'm French and uh, basically I was born and raised uh, in Algeria in North Africa. Oh, yeah. And may I know your name? My name is Nell in E L L. Uh -huh. um, for French speaking people, it's too short. So when I'm in France, people prefer Nelly Elizabeth. Oh, okay. Nice. Very elegant. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. So you're, uh, you're a writer, huh? Um, I'm doing research and I write books and, and scientific articles and I mm -hmm. give trainings, conferences, seminars. So I'm kind of a yeah, uh, grassroots researcher. Let's say. I see. I see. Um, um, I, uh, yeah. I used to be a real researcher, you know, oh. a, a scholarly researcher writing um, scholarly books, and then I started again. I, I went back to school. Um, I got a bachelor's degree and a master's degree in painting. So I sort of um, go back and forth. I don't belong anywhere. I never did, but um, in terms of what I do in art now, it's strange art because the art people think it's too much illustration because I still talk about history. I was a historian. Yes, yes. I guess that's why it's so uh, important that you're doing your intersectional work. Yeah, and, uh, yeah, yeah. And the sentence you said, you know, uh, I, I don't belong uh, anywhere. That's something I could say also because I'm between grassroots and research and, you know, mm -hmm. psychology, theology, anthropology. Oh so it's like I've done a, um, a master degree in uh, Ecole Normale Supérieure, which is like. Uh, yes, I understand. Yes, yes. <laughs> uh, Means you're a hot shot. <laughs> And then I've done a, a PhD in anthropology and a PhD in psychology. Oh my gosh. And I was like, yeah, but university might be too, uh, too tight to, uh -huh. to, to be, especially in, in France. I don't know uh, where you live and where you work. Yes. In France, if you go beyond certain borders, you know, yes. it, it's not science anymore. Yes. And you're like yes. criticized a lot and you spend more time trying to explain who you are instead of explaining what you do so okay <laughs> yes my first degree a long time ago um was in anthropology okay and it was such a long time ago it was before anthropology um, um reinvented change. itself you okay. know now when you say anthropology it's not like you have to go live with some quote unquote primitive people and study them as if they were not in the world. <laughs> yes. that, that was the anthropology I studied. And then after that, the anthropologists discovered that they're, they're authors and that their so-called primitive people actually live in the world. Yes. So I'm sure you do the more recent, I mean, Tell me about your anthropology. So um, just uh, may I ask you, where do you live? <sighs> right now I am living 
in the Adirondack Mountains of far northern New York State. Okay. So this is the largest um, state park in the United States, yes. and it's the oldest. So it's the Adirondack Mountains. We are on the side of a hill between a hill that goes like this and a river. It's, re it's really very nice. But I also live in Newark, New Jersey. Uh -huh. And Newark is part of the New York City metropolitan area. So, you know, it's a real city. And we live in the part of the city that's right by the main train station. There are two train stations in Newark. So um, I live 20 minutes by train uh, from New York City. Yes, I, I've uh, I lived a few months in in the Queens. Uh, yes, and for the train for a training there. Uh, phew, it was like fifteen years ago, also, oh more, twenty years ago. Yeah, and uh, I've been to your uh, your side of New York State to visit the park with friends. Oh, you was, have? Yes, yes, it was gorgeous. Yeah. It was gorgeous. Yeah. Uh, big rivers and yes. uh, cascades. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. it was so beautiful. So beautiful. It is. Uh, we have uh, a year-round house, uh -huh. so we have actually been here two months. Okay. Um, we came here on the 14th of March, directly from Italy. Okay. Exactly. It, when uh, coronavirus was ravaging Italy, and we <laughs> got out just before total chaos. And we came directly up here. Um, so, you know, it's like we got to JFK, we got a limo back home, we picked up our cars, we didn't even unpack our bags, we put the bags in the car and drove straight up here. And so the 15th of March was before Americans really got into it. And so, you know, we didn't have any problems at all. But a couple of weeks, we did two weeks of quarantine, and then uh, we started walking on a, an unpaved mountain road, and we would drive our car with New Jersey license plates to get to this road. And first of all, our neighbors started telling us that people were asking questions about us. And then one time, a neighbor shouted at us, get out of here and so you know it's like we were terrible summer people and that kind of, you know there's i understand that has happened in france also yes, yes, yes. yeah but the strange thing for me is that you know when you talk about summer people it's like this stereotype of rich white people and i'm a black person so it's kind of strange you know to be um have pitchforks out uh, against me as a summer person. So I actually bought a little used Jeep uh, with, new, with New York plates. So I'm yeah. kind of undercover as a local, as undercover as I can be in myself. <laughs> so anyway, that's where I live. Well, that's and very interesting. What you see behind me is the room where I work, which is a total mess, uh, and which I swear I am going to clean up. I really am. <laughs> um, I split my time. Um, I haven't made art since I was in, I was in an art residency in Italy. So my last art was in March. And since then, I've been writing because I've been writing all this time. When people think of me, they think of a writer. So I'm much more in demand as a writer than as an artist. But more and more people know me as somebody who can write about art, for one thing. And I make artist books. So my little art books, I illustrate. Um, so I'm, you know, that's another way in which I don't really have a home. Uh, too much of a writer to be an artist and too much of an artist to be a writer. <laughs> so tell me about stereotypes. And, and my work is, is turning around that concept. 
our yes. identity, who we are. Um, yes. So I do study a lot for 15 years now, minorities, and yes. how individuals are considered for good or bad reasons to be part of sexual, ethnical, religious minorities, and sometimes linguistic minorities, yes. are facing that uh, concept of stereotype, who you yes. are, I'm going yeah. to tell you who you are, you know, especially with uh, what you said, I'm black, and this is the stereotype about summer people and so on. That's very interesting because, yes. oh, especially where I'm I come just, from. Just, just one second. Yes, dear? Yeah. Okay. My husband forgot I'm busy. <laughs> <laughs> okay, sad. go ahead. I'm sorry. You're dealing with stereotypes oh. and what people yes, yes. expect. Yeah. Especially oh. in North Africa. Um, where I'm coming from, that that idea of black, white yes. is not as vivid, vivid as it is in in Europe or in the West. Yes. yes. Sort of speak, because it's like we all like in our families we we call it so we have every color and every yeah. style of. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. I had to adapt to that new concept of putting borders between people according to. Uh, I mean, we have all the stereotypes, of course, but sure. not especially the same ones. And so I was very much interested into how people are dealing with the norm, what is normal, what is not normal, yes. Yes. and how do they, you know, as you said, with that used chip, how they, do they use uh, certain tools, ideological identity tools, to, to get under cover and to be able to negotiate yes. easily? <laughs> right. <laughs> I, yeah. Interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I hadn't thought of my Jeep as uh, <laughs> an identity tool, but that's terrific. <laughs> definitely, uh, as I see it, uh, it's definitely, uh, yeah, what you can define as a tool to negotiate the norm yeah. in an easier way, because someone else would have gone to fight, you know? Who are yes. you? You yell at me. Yes. I'm a citizen like you, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. But you decided to go like the sidewalk, you know, something... Uh, my, as I see it, more peaceful. <laughs> it's like, okay, yes. guys, yeah. I can yes. this is weird. You, you, you have a very, very interesting stereotype about myself that I didn't think about, but let's negotiate, you know, if it's yeah. easier for you with New York uh, plague instead of uh, New Jersey. New one. Jersey, yeah. And, yeah. And, and also crossing that factor of minority with sexuality and gender. Yes. being a woman, being homosexual, being uh, transgender and so on. Mm -hmm. If you come also from an, from an ethnical or religious minority, how do you double negotiate that norm? Is it easier? For some people it is because once they understand how it works, yes. then it's easier for them to, you know, to adapt to different networks and different uh, political dynamics. But for some people it's even harder because it's like, oh, I'm HIV positive and I'm North African and I'm gay and yeah. I'm, so there's a lot yeah. going on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Too yeah. much. Sometimes yeah. too much. So that's what we're doing. You know, um, I have been going to France since the 1960s, and things have changed so much in identity terms. So um, you may know that my book, The History of White People, appeared in a French edition last year. So I was talking to people about identity issues. And um, the conversations I had in France about identity w were much more like the way we talk about identity in the United States. But earlier in France, you couldn't have that kind of conversation because people didn't see identity. They didn't see identity. You know, you were just French. That's all there was to it. <laughs> yeah. uh, and if there was something else, nobody could hear about it. They couldn't understand what you might be talking about. But um, I, I, one concept that I discovered, um, maybe it was with uh, Cédric, um, um, I did junior year abroad in France, in Bordeaux, and this was in the early 60s. So it was like right after in the Algerian War. Yes, yes. And I learned only like 40 years later that Bordeaux was like the center of 
what was going on, you know, the outcomes, the Aki and the Pied Noir and all of this. And if I had known what was, you know, I could have learned so much more about France, but the war but was, was non Yes, invisible completely, yeah. Yeah. And I, I don't know if how much it still is in, you know, in Bordeaux. Um, can, it would be the grandchildren of the people who yes. I might have known, you know, how the, they might talk about their identity specifically rooted in Bordeaux. So um, I don't know much uh, about Bordeaux, but I know, of course, more uh, Marseille because I've been living here with my family since the uh, civil war in Algeria. We came here. Oh, you're in Marseille. Time. Ah, yeah, yeah. And I'm in Marseille. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, Marseille has a similar uh, history, if I, if I understand well, because we uh -huh. also had a lot of, I mean, they had a lot of people coming from North Africa, Pied Noir and Harkis and so yes. on, yes. after the Algerian uh, independence. Yes. And, uh, and even before that, and I discovered that while I was here, uh, finishing my studies and so on, I, I met a lot of people, friends of my mother, older people, you know, yes. who were um, uh, born here, you know, they're yes. 60, 70 years old yes. uh, women from Algerian background, but yes. born here. So because their parents came to work here and they stayed yes. here even for the independence. Yes. Yes. And that's something also that we, we don't hear about, you know, that diversity of identities and, ah. and personal histories and family traditions and, and backgrounds and, and so on, and heritage. We, we, we don't talk too much about it because it's still a very, very big problem in France to speak about colonization and the yes. uh. responsibility. Uh, are we guilty? I still had... Um, the chance to look at a TV program yesterday where Eric Zemmour, I don't know. Yes, uh, yes. Yes, yes, writer. yes, yes. So, yes, yes. So he was like debating about the fact that, yeah, you guys, uh, someone else was speaking about history and colonization in front of him, of course, and you know him. So it was like so harsh on, on that poor guy because he was like, okay, you're going to speak about colonization once again and you're going to tell us that we are yeah. guilty of what we've yeah. done, but yeah. everybody did yeah. it. Yeah. So, you yeah. know, yeah. but at yeah. least yeah. now, I guess that people are talking about it. Some yeah. things are still hidden, invisible, taboo, and even forbidden by law, like you could yes. not still yes. up today yes. have ethnic statistics. Yes. So you don't know who is who and who is coming from where. So if you want to, let's say, a crazy ID, fight back discrimination and racism at work, you cannot do it like a, in a proper way, of course. Uh, ah, yeah, so, yeah. Yeah, it's still forbidden. So yeah, we, we still have a long way. And I think that the culture that we had in the uh, 90s here in France when I arrived in 95 changed completely. It, it's, yes. it's about to completely change uh, in, in that uh, regard. But um, I don't know if we are handling the change in a, such a good way. You know what I mean? So it, it's more visible, but it's still a huge problem. And there's so many things that are still hidden under the carpet. Mm -hmm. So honestly, I don't know how we're going to get out of this. And everybody's talking about the crisis, uh, coronavirus yeah. and so on. Yes. It's going to be a new word because, because we're going to be so aware. And uh, I don't think so. <laughs> I just think that people are going to be even more afraid of living together and sharing. So we'll see. Well, France, like the United States, is a big country. So everything is probably going on um, in the United, well, I'm trying to say two things at once here. Um, one thing is that the United States is a really big country and that the, the 30 to 40% of Americans who were Trumpers, uh, who believe he was anointed by God, who want to parade around with their guns. That's a lot of Americans. But I don't think it's the majority of Americans. And certainly, I have been able to find um, anti-racist groups, even up here, 
um, I hang out with people. Uh, our group is called John Brown Lives. You know John Brown, right? Mm -hmm. John Brown, who's, yeah, Harper's Ferry, uh, anti-slavery, 1859. Mm -hmm. So John Brown has this wonderful anti-racist legacy around him. And he's buried up here in the North Country. There's a John Brown farm. So, you know, I have my little anti-racist group even up here, which is part of the United States. So the first thing, though, the two that I wanted to say was that it's a big country and there are a lot of different kinds of people in it. Thank God. The second thing, though, dealing with France and the, it's not a history that you're in, it's what's going on now that you're in and you're wondering about what's going to happen. And one thing that crossed my mind when I was in France last year was that the American history of white supremacy is absolutely horrendous you know, lynchings, murders, uh, disfranchisement, you know, just ugh, all these horrible things. And then when I listened to French people talking about trying to sort things out identity-wise, I thought, you know, the United States has something to teach France. And part of that is the other history, the anti-racist history, which may not be um, majoritarian in terms of laws, because so much of American history really is anti, is anti-black, anti-native, um, the legal system. But there's also this long-running history of contestation. And that, I think, is something that would be helpful for French people, maybe, um, to understand that counter current. Yes, for that, I would say we need strong intellectual um, analysis of, of the relationship uh, between the two societies, like USA and France. And, and how could we adapt certain concepts that have been developed for decades now that uh -huh. we're missing in the US, yeah. from the USA yeah. to France? And yeah. the issue is that with that you know, chaotic noise that we hear from Zemmour, from other left-wing, also extremist or radical uh, yeah, yeah. activists, that from that noise, uh, um, what I see up to now, maybe it's going to change, but it's going to take a lot of time, uh, yeah. We, we're hearing even more stereotypes. So for instance, there's that um, ID circulating uh, at the left wing of the uh, uh, political life here in France mm -hmm. about the fact that, you know, gay identities and gay prides and, um, and so on uh, became slowly but surely another racist weapon used against African um, uh, uh, and Muslim uh, communities uh, in France, like you guys, you oh, don't talk. Oh, right, right, right. You're anti-feminist. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. They all barbarians. Yeah. They all patriarchal. They don't know anything mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. about mm -hmm. those issues mm -hmm. because they're coming mm -hmm. from African backgrounds. You know? mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. uh, the idea, uh, I mean, the answer of certain activists was to adapt certain con certain concepts about uh, essentialization of gender. Sure. In the West, uh, yeah. you have to be a white man like this. You have to be a white woman like this, but yes. nothing in between, and nothing for other, you know, my, uh, ethnic my, or religious yeah. minorities. Yes. We don't speak about that. So this has become also a weapon used mm -hmm. by certain left-wing um, activists answering to uh -huh. Eric Zemmour and to others, telling mm -hmm. them no. But that concept of, you know, we have to decide. Uh, what which category do we belong to? Uh, to? Uh, are we a woman, a man, a gay, a transgender? This is also part of the Western uh, intellectual colonization. So, I think that certain concept uh, about deconstructing identity, mm -hmm. 
mm -hmm. deconstructing white, black, slavery, colonization, homosexuality, very important. And of course, in the USA and the uh, English speaking countries, of, uh, obviously you have so much more uh, matter in terms of intellectual matter, but- Well, we have more people, I, uh, <laughs> we have more people. That's it. Yeah. That's it. We're missing. That's what we're missing. Um, Big intellectuals like Michel Foucault that we had. Yes. The late but Michel Foucault. He's not helpful for this conversation. No, not at all. Not at all. No. <laughs> and don't get me on Lacan. <laughs> no, those people are not useful. But um, what I see happening, I mean, part of me wants to say to you, don't worry, just keep talking and keep publishing and keep encouraging other people because that's the way you change something. Yes. Um, but the other part of me says, oh, Allah, how are we going <laughs> you know? So I, I feel both ways. But what, um, what I have seen here uh, in the US since, I would say the serious conversation started around the time of Obama. So that's like 2008. So uh, what's that, uh, 12 years ago? Huh? Um, no, how many years ago is that? It's a long time ago. So, um, and then my book, um, The History of White People, came out in 2010. And since then, there have been all these other books of discussions about the meaning of whiteness, which was totally um, taken for granted. And so in, on one hand, it's kind of a natural progression that people keep talking, but it's not a natural progression. You have to keep people talking. Um, and I, I, I see that, that uh, David has given us a prompt of community, and that is one way to keep people talking, is to have a community that says to writers and thinkers, yeah, 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 keep talking, keep talking. And part of that is through publishing your own works and showing your own works. Um, I was somewhere, maybe it was when I was in Italy, I remember somebody saying that they wanted to start a Biennale in, in Syria. And I thought, how are you going to do that? But that's exactly the kind of thing that's needed. I mean, Marseille, Aul, uh, you know, you have wonderful um, uh, cultural infrastructure there already to keep people talking. Um, when I hear the word community, I hear it almost, almost as um, a hard word, a word that wants to corral people within identities that are, well, simple, really. Yes, yes. So um, at the same time, I know that you need community to keep people talking and keep people encouraged and keep people going. On the other hand, community can work to simplify. When, when you started talking earlier in our conversation, you talked about the many facets of identity, um, not just regional or national or generational, but, but also um, of sexual orientation. And uh, in the United States, you need to add um, bodily um, integrity or uh, challenges, uh, disabilities as well. So there's a lot more. Um, and if we are always fragmented into uh, the community that, that is recognizable, the disability community, the mm -hmm. trans community, that's that I think tends to tamp people down. I mean, it's a place to start though. It's a place to start. Yeah. Absolutely, and uh, you know, I have a, a, a friend who is working uh, in a university. He's from a French background, but he's living in Morocco and working uh -huh. as a professor at the university there. 
And I was at the beginning of my research about that topic, and he told me once, you know, that was so powerful. I was still, because I'm coming from psychology, so I discovered sociology and anthropology uh, uh, with my PhD, second PhD, yeah. and I, he was yeah. like, you know, but sociology is very powerful because some people are telling you that what you're studying is not a reality, it doesn't exist, but you have to show them that nonetheless, in terms of citizenship, in terms of human beings, in terms of humanity, human diversity, on, and also in terms of intellectual uh, uh, objective analysis, it is mm -hmm. a reality. You do exist, and people like that, like that, do exist. So, yes, yes, it, it's very important to use that as a start, and then to um, to show all the that continuum between all all of us. And uh -huh. that's what we need to do in Marseille, as you said, with that huge diversity that we have yeah. here. Uh, we created a, a network called Houses, the Houses of Inclusion in Marseille. Uh -huh. So organizations the, like ours. The, the English word houses? Uh, houses, but with an A, you know, because French people would say houses. Yes. yes. How do you spell so it? A-O-Z-I-Z. Oh, I see. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. From North African background, you would say houses. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a bit of humor, you know, but uh -huh. we are in uh, 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 organizations working on gender, ethnicity, disability, art, also dancers and actors. Uh -huh. and so yeah, that's what we start starting to 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 do, and you know we we part of different festivals that are all cancelled mm -hmm. and postponed and so on, but still we submitted to the Pride, for example. Yes. And, um, to the Pride, and they were like, "Okay, but who are you? This is who <laughs> who are, are you?" you? Yes. <laughs> yeah. Reading yeah. the question of who we are, it's like they didn't get it. It was yeah. uh, it was yeah. too much of a community and and not a community for them. So. So that, did that's they finally exactly get it? Uh, still not, I think, but they did accept us to be part of them. So, which is like a, the beginning of a, a success, yes. I guess. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. Everything is such a struggle. Yes, yes. I was talking about that with a young uh, fellow who left this morning, actually. He was staying here for the confinement with us and then... He, he left because we have like a shelter where we welcome uh -huh. refugee coming from, uh -huh. uh, from African countries and Middle yes. Eastern countries. In, in, yes. uh, while they're asking for papers and refuge, yes. asylum uh, status and so on. So anyway, yes. he was staying with us, helping with the shelter. So we stayed here for two months, closed up only with ourselves. Oh and my. talked a lot. And he's 23 uh -huh. years old. And he, he told me, oh, but this is so hard because he, you know, he's very much into chakras and meditation, like, like me from other, another tradition, mm -hmm. but we had mm -hmm. a lot in common from, from that essential uh, root, you know? And he told me, it, it seems to be so hard to make people understand what, what, what is so obvious. I told him, yes, yes, and it's only the beginning, so you're still young. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But what is obvious to one person is not necessarily obvious to others. And, and even if it's it. obvious, it may not be able to be paid for because yes. raising money is always, at least in, in the United States, raising money is an, always an issue because we don't have much in the way of state-supported arts. Yes, yes, yes. Very and here also for the topics that we're dealing with, it's very hard because as you said earlier in the conversation, you're too much of an African for them, or Muslim, or queer, or not enough of a normal citizen. So uh -huh. it's very hard to find foundations. Generally, we work internationally, because here uh -huh. locally, it's very hard to yeah, find foundations, not only understanding who you are, why yes. you're doing it, but the fact yes. that it is very important. And we developed, for that uh, reason, uh, a model that is self-sustained, uh -huh. So we work for people for a few days, a few weeks, that paying, that uh -huh. who are paying you know, their uh, place yeah. in the shelter in yes. order to share the life and help and be part of the community. Oh, like uh -huh. that, it helps yeah. the community to, you know, to be self-sustainable. Otherwise, it's, yeah, it's very hard to, 
That's so interesting. So people will pay to come to your shelter. Yes, yes. You, you, there's great people in the world. You just have to call for them. <laughs> you know. Okay. <laughs> yes, Very good. Very Not good. a lot, but it helps. Uh -huh. Enough. Yeah. Enough. And yeah. the books and conferences and the trainings that we give, all of that in the organization is kind of self-sustained, you know, and independent. So nobody is going to tell you, you don't have the right to say this or that. Uh -huh. Otherwise, I'm not going to found you anymore. So, you know, you're completely yes. free. Then, yes. Of course, we work with foundations and festivals and so yes. on, but only yes. for, you know, punctual activities like a, a seminar or something uh -huh. they ask us, but we're not depending on them. You know? Right. So you say we. How many are you? So, so far, uh, we are, uh, let me think, we are like uh, uh, around uh, half a dozen organizations mm -hmm. working locally. Oh, half a dozen organizations. With, Goodness. Yes, yes, like six, seven organizations yes. working yes. on projects like the Pride this year. Yes. Yes. We are talking for next week of a meeting because more people came and said, okay, what we've seen at the seminar from you that network or what we've seen at the festival in terms of dancing with handicapped mm -hmm. disabled people and queer people and straight people and mm -hmm. white and black and big and fat and small and, and skinny. We want to be part of that. So uh, yeah, I, I think it was a bargain on the future, but this is the right place to do it, Marseille, yes. because of that diversity and because yes. of that freedom also of thinking, you know, because we, uh -huh. we don't feel like we totally belong to the Mediterranean culture, we don't yes. totally belong to the European culture. So in between is, is, is very interesting, I think. Yes, yes. So um, they faith. have sent a prompt of faith, yeah. And you touched on that a, a little bit. A bit um, yes. And I'd like to pick up on it in two ways. Um, one that I touched on, and that is that the community that is most supportive of President Trump is a religious, it's white evangelical Christians. And they would say their faith has taken them in that direction. Of course. But I would also add, personally, um, I grew up in a Methodist church. Um, so... Protestant, not evangelical, um, very mainstream. Um, and in, in the United States, you probably know that churches are very much segregated still. Yes, yes. Um, and they're segregated culturally as well as by race and class. My husband is a white American who also grew up in a mainstream Protestant uh, denomination in the Midwest. So, so in terms of what we want from faith, it's very similar. And actually what we want from a congregation is very similar. But what we want from a congregation, sort of mainline Protestant, tends to be overwhelmingly white. And I spend enough time with white people, you know, not to want to uh, sort of spend my off time with overwhelmingly white. Because, you know, white people in the United States are, are still so uninformed. And so for me to spend a lot of time with strange white people means that I would do a lot of educating. And, you know... <laughs> <laughs> It's very tiresome. I mean, don't get me wrong. Some of my best friends are white. <laughs> but they're special white people. You know, they're educated white people. They're, they're evolved white people. They're not necessarily masses of white people you'd find in church. So for me personally, faith doesn't work. But I know that for many Black Americans, faith is really important. And I will give you um, one example of my ill fit. Um, 
I used to teach at the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill, which is in the South. And the Black faculty and student groups, which I belonged to and supported, would tend to include prayers, which was totally antithetical to me. Yes. And I'll bet you run into that kind of thing in your work as well, that people want to bring religion into situations where for you or maybe for others, it doesn't belong, or it may be divisive. I mean, I can imagine in a multicultural place like Marseille, the whole question of Islam and Judaism must be, oh! Yes, yes. How do you deal with it? Uh, it's less problematic than in other big cities in France, believe it or not, because uh, because of that background, you know, very diverse background since the foundation of the city 2000 sure. years ago. Yeah. So it's easier to work on those topics, which was very astonishing even, I mean, even for me, yeah. than it was in Paris, where it became so uh, touchy to speak about diversity and... If you speak about that, it's like you, you always find someone in front of you, black, white, uh, yellow, whatever, that is going to take it personally, you know, for himself and mm -hmm. his or mm -hmm. her ancestors. So, yeah, that's why I, I started uh, speaking out loud uh, more and more about inclusive representations of faith uh, traditions, because uh -huh. in Algeria, I was studying to become an imam. Uh -huh. um, in a Salafi madrasa, in a Salafi school. I was yeah. coming from a family that was more into Sufism, mysticism, yes. Yes. Something, something very peaceful and inclusive yes. and tolerant. Not yes. perfect, a bit patriarchal, but not as much as the mm -hmm. Salafi mm -hmm. dogmatic tradition mm -hmm. coming from Saudi Arabia, you know, the yes. 50s yes. Uh, independence. It helped at a point. But now it turned to be a, long-term poison even for those societies who produced mm -hmm. that dogmatism you know very radical fascistic yeah. representation of yeah. Islam. yeah and in the 70s we had like that idea that we are not africans we are arabs just because we've been colonized oh. by arabs you know and we are muslims mm -hmm. as a majority uh, especially after the 62 independence where they put unfortunately everyone out Yes. including Jewish, Algerian backgrounded yes. people, because they yes. said, oh, you accepted yes. the French yes. nationality. Of course, you know the history. French yes. government at that time in early 19, uh, 20th century did that to divide, yes. you know? Yes, yes. But, you know, it was a problem. It became like a poison also, not only like a political issue, but like mm -hmm. a, a structural uh, uh, inner dynamic poison for the Algerian uh, identity because yes. Yes. they started telling us we are Arabs, we all Muslims, yes. so we yes. have to speak Arabic yes. at school from one yes. year to the other in the seventies, you know? Yes. And yes. Teaching math and physics and history started teaching in Arabic. They didn't know how to do it. Mm -hmm. So we have to bring uh, teachers from Egypt and Saudi Arabia. Yes. And that's how they brought books of Arabic but also books of dogmatism and political Islam oh, in their yeah so that's how we starting to have that mainstream islam in algeria becoming a foreign alien islam uh, and also fa very fascistic islam yeah very so nationalistic. that's what yeah very nationalistic very patriarchal so yes. at that time when i came to france i started asking my, uh, myself many questions about identity and sexuality of course and so on and so forth so I kind of rejected very strongly faith and especially Islam aside. Oh. And then I came back to it through Buddhism and meditation. Uh -huh. You know, it's so sexy, so peaceful. Sure. And then when I've been to Tibet. Yes. I heard exactly the same BS, you know, about women and queer. And I was like, wow, that sounds so Islamic to me. <laughs> so <laughs> maybe, maybe it's not faith. Maybe it's what is behind that facade. You know, mm -hmm. the facade may be uh, social nationalism or communism or Islamism, but it's always the same problem. The underlying mechanisms of fascism are always the same. So that's how I started, you know, st studying how, why fascistic ideologies are always tar targeting minorities. And that was the basis of my, my research, you know, but, but 
At that time, it was still very personal. Yes. So I reintroduced faith, uh, Islamic practice of oh. faith in my life, very slowly but surely. Oh. And now, you know, and then I, we founded in 2010, uh, a queer Muslim organization uh, in France, the first one. Oh and then we founded an inclusive mosques where gays and women could be imams and leaders of the oh faith. Oh my uh, word. Gays congregation and so on. So it was like, wow, a big revolution in France, as you can imagine. Because Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. How could you be leaders? You don't even exist. So yeah. that's why I started to understand that faith could be used in a way for uh, a humanistic agenda, yes. not a political yes. one. Yes. So, yes. Personally and also ideologically, I made peace with that. Uh, but yeah, it was a 20 years struggle. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, you still have time <laughs> to bring yeah. along others. Yeah, that's why I have so much respect for people who are doing it for longer. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Because it could be exhausting, yeah? It is exhausting and it can drive you crazy. I don't think people should be expected to be on the activist front lines for more than 20 or 30 years. Yes, because yes, yes. It's, it's always such a minority of people who actually get things done. So the people who were doing things get overworked and burned out. Absolutely, absolutely. Burn out is a, an old friend. <laughs> oh dear well i hope you have a place that you can go and sort of uh sit well maybe you can go and sit peacefully in thailand somewhere uh, ah, no, uh, actually the good thing about being in marseille is like uh we have sun we have sea you do uh, my family is here i have good friends and colleagues and so yeah generally i travel a lot for for work Mm -hmm. So uh, I always tell people when I have vacations, I, I just stay at home in Marseille. Uh -huh. <laughs> okay. I, you know, walking in the Calanques, you know, those yes. uh, natural parks. And that's right. That's right. Yes, yes, yes. My husband was there for a meeting and, and he mentioned the parks. Yes. It's, it's wonderful. We've been there with friends a few days ago and it's like a little paradise on earth. So yeah. Yes. For, and I try to reduce work and travel a lot just because you know my body is not working as uh, ex, uh, uh, you know energetically as uh, as yeah. before yeah you know the story that's also part of uh, experience i guess yes growing old <laughs> <laughs> well, you know uh, and this is okay. the next topic we'll oh yeah. oh oh yeah <laughs> Um, I almost wrote a book on beauty, and uh, beauty is uh, an important concept in race, of course. So in my book, History of White People, I actually have a chapter on uh, personal beauty as a scientific concept, um, which certainly uh, worked in the 19th century, uh, 18th and 19th centuries. But today, when I mean, when I say today, I mean literally today, there's a lot of discussion about evolving ideas about female beauty because of people being locked down. So when you stay home, the question is, do you wear makeup every day? Well, no, <laughs> that's very easy for me. But I just read a column in the New York Times by a, a woman who's talking about it as, as a current issue. That is, uh, how do you dress when you're not going out uh, for other people's view? And beauty is, um, I think, in very many ways about other people looking at Women, yeah, not just women. I mean, when I started working on the, the book never, uh, never materialized, but when I started thinking about it and researching it, one place where I found really interesting commentary was in gay men's writing because personal beauty was so important. Um, since then, I think there's maybe less of that because of the mainstreaming of gayness. And it's yes. become like, what do you buy to get it? 
<laughs> Buy me, love me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but you know, the cosmetics and cosmetic surgery and all. And then there's the question of beauty in art. And when I was in art school, I discovered that the word, if you, if I'm, you know, looking at the, the card behind your head and I said, oh, that is beautiful. It, yeah, there we go. And it is beautiful. Uh, uh, yeah. But if you were the person who made that, you might think, oh, that's a trivialization of my art, that it's just decorative. And so beauty can be kind of an insult in art. You need something much more activist or challenging. Yeah. Okay. Very interesting. Very interesting because I I I'm, I try to be as a dilettante as much as possible into <laughs> art. And what does art mean? And and my psychoanalyst. Uh, analyst a few years ago was uh, very well known to be also a psychoanalyst and also an art expert. Uh -huh. uh, uh, Madame Jean Solin, uh, uh -huh. psychoanalyst in, in Marseille, but she retired this year actually. Uh -huh. And she was telling me a lot about that in our conversations at the end. Uh -huh. you know, like, like, mm -hmm. The mess and the stress and the, she, she was very much into that, trying to inspire me other, other concepts to use Mm -hmm. uh, not just you know uh, analysis affirmation uh, political dynamics uh, you know that was where i was coming from and oh. uh, beauty is something that uh, even in in spirituality in mysticism that's something that is a, a key concept to use to understand uh, deeper who we are actually it's a positive concept right Absolutely, and and also for for minorities in the research I, I've done so far, I've seen as you said before that queer or ethnic minorities are very much when they survive all the you know stress and pressure and uh, mm -hmm. when they survive intellectually and in terms of uh, personal identity, mm -hmm. they go very mm -hmm. deep sometimes into spirituality, art, beauty more than the average of the population because it becomes uh -huh. like a strategy for, 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 for them, for us, in order to, to survive, actually. So that's very interesting because generally when they, they speak about art in France, most of them tend to consider that art is, is done for itself. It doesn't need a purpose. I'm sorry, and art is? It's just done for itself. It doesn't uh -huh. need all you know yes. and and that yes. idea of art being an activist uh, uh affirmation yes. Yes. is very problematic yes. but good uh, positively problematic uh -huh. question mm -hmm. something mm -hmm. about the french society mm -hmm. engaged art as opposed to art for art's sake um art for art's sake i think now is at least I think it's it's less respectable among artists that engaged art is much more respectable, much more appreciated. And in these times that we are in, engaged art becomes even more uh, prized. And especially for black artists, it's like you have to, your art has to critique uh, racism, it has to critique white supremacy. And that can be kind of um, oppressive too. So we go back and forth between um, being able to see non-engaged art as well, like abstract art, for instance. So in the 1970s, it was very difficult for a black artist who was doing abstract art to be seen because engaged art was all there was to it. And the critics, the critics would approach black art as if it were sociology, to weigh, weigh its worth in terms of its critique of American society and white supremacy, as if that were the reason. So it's, it's a hard um, line to walk in which you want artists to be creative 
that art for art's sake is kind of airy fairy. I mean, that's asking, that is not true. But then must all art be understood as sociology? So all this is going on in the way we think about art today, at least in the United States. I suspect that's also true in France. Um, yes, yes, and, and also academic research. Uh, do, do you do research just to for the sake of, of science and, uh, and that's yeah. objectivity? That's what they told me when I defended my uh, anthropology thesis. Yes. And at the end, my teacher told me you did a great job and they gave me the highest score. But they told me after two PhDs, they told me you're still not a researcher. You're still an activist. What? Yes, ah. yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, you got the that's PhD. <laughs> You could yes, laugh all the way to the bank, so to speak. <laughs> yeah. That's yeah. so, especially in sociology and anthropology, they're supposed to be experts of who we, we are as a society, how yes. it works. Yes. And you yes. see, they tell you about objectivity and science and uh, being impartial and so on. And at the end, you see that there's more stereotypes and they sustain that kind of stereotypes with, with intellectual tools, which, which makes it even... Uh, a deeper poison, you know, for the mind and for the society around. Right. And, and like, okay, guys, but just open your eyes. And as you said before, you know, something obvious for you, maybe because you're coming from there and you're having this or you're living that, is not obvious for others. So we still you just have to mm -hmm. continue doing do it, yes. Do you have any difficulty publishing or getting your ideas out? Have you faced a pushback? Uh, so my latest book, let's do ah. some, some self promotion here. <laughs> oh, beautiful. About, uh, Ooh. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, going to be in Islam. And that has been published by the Amsterdam University. Uh -huh. And one week. Oh, I'm, I'm losing my sound. It's published by Amsterdam and what? Amsterdam University Press. Yes. And when we were uh, speaking about that same book with my former teacher, PhD uh, supervisor, she said, no, no, this is not objective. We could not publish that. You should not go that way because you're going to lose your career and they're going to come back to me because I trained you. Ah, it was like such a big issue for her and now yes. you see it's published in one of the biggest <laughs> yes. the study university in the world so uh -huh. yes it's problematic in france because they don't speak the same language you know what yes. i mean so yes. it's still french but the concepts are not the same so yes. they don't hear you so you have too much uh, too much education in, uh, as you said before with those people to do so mm -hmm. yeah it's too much energy you you just have to go somewhere else so and you could bit, yeah of course, of course, because I have the network, but there's so many other researchers, you know, grassroots researchers, very, very valuable, uh, useful research that uh, are never published because of that, because those yes. people yes. are too yes. rich in yes. terms of networking and visibility. Yes. Because I have that visibility, so I'm trying to use it to publish that kind of material, but that was yes. like uh, two years uh, more, three years work just to get the book accepted somewhere. So, yes. Yeah. Does your your group have a publishing arm? Can yes, you publish things also, yourself? Yes. Yes. We have like a tiny uh, publishing house, but we are like publishing new authors. Yes. Trans, about trans identity, about inclusive faith, about uh, fighting back against racism yeah. without falling yes. into one thing. Yeah or the other so yeah. that's the kind of book that we want to so yes. it's about uh, sociology autobiography and inclusive faith perspectives mm -hmm. great well that's how act soon got started as a smaller as a small publisher publishing um engaged texts yes yes we have to gut the faith yeah yeah so new beginnings it sounds to me like you don't need a new beginning you need to just do what you're doing thank you do you thank need you. a new beginning uh 
No, I think I could not cope with it. <laughs> so yeah, that's the point about uh, intersectionality. You, you're working on so many different fronts. Yeah. Yeah. At some point, you have to regroup strategically and forget about some, uh, and train people to the new generation to do it. So yeah. that's why I was telling you about elder researchers and activists and I'm almost I'm always very uh, respectful when I'm in front of people who survived activism yeah. and intersection yeah. of research yeah. like what yeah. you're doing yeah. you're still working and you're still writing yeah. and you're still traveling yeah. so yeah it sounds like a a battle a peaceful battle to you I don't know you look very well peaceful. I I do have a new beginning though I have a new job okay um I am um Madam Chairman of the McDowell Colony uh, in New Hampshire. And so the colony right now is closed down because the coronavirus. But uh, do you know about McDowell Colony? No, it's, it's I think, the oldest artist residency in the United States um, okay. since 1907. Uh, it's very prestigious, been going on for a long time, um, and brings people for the freedom to create. And that's wow. the motto, freedom to create. Um, so you have a studio, um, you can come get your breakfast, your lunch is brought to you, and then you come have dinner with the other artists, you know, 20, 30 other artists. You can do that for two weeks, a month, sometimes longer. So it's been a lifeline uh, for um, artists, that is composers, dancers, uh, writers, um, visual artists. I've been there twice. I finished my, my memoir, Old in Art School, about going to art school as an old lady. Uh, I completed that in 2016 at McDowell. Um, and okay. then I was just there last fall working on my artist book, which is called um, American Whiteness Since Trump, which is kind of depressing, actually. <laughs> um, it's not totally depressing, yeah, but there's a lot of depressing stuff. And I have not had chance to do the next part of it, which is about uh, coronavirus and um, the controversies that have roiled um, white people um, during since uh, the spring and since the white nationalists are the ones who parade around uh, with their guns uh, in places like Michigan's um, um, legislature and so forth so visible whiteness has been um, they call it freedom, that is freedom not to wear a mask and not to stay home, and that, to infect people, basically. So that'll be the next part. But I will have uh, an institutional role with uh, the McDowell Colony that I'm looking forward to, and I have not done this, um, I have not been that intimately involved in an arts organization before. So that's my new beginning. Congratulations. Yeah, yeah, that looks Thank like you. terrific. Yeah. So, so recommendations? Recommendations. Actually, I, I did have some um, recommendations. They may not be um, appropriate for you. Um, I don't really listen to music. I listen to one program a week called Afro Pop Worldwide. And it's about um, the African diaspora of music. But since we've been um, stuck at home all this time, I've been listening and reading books a lot. And I just want to mention one, and if you know it, I would love to know your thoughts about it. It's by Isabella Hamad, and it's called The Parisian, as in Paris. Do you know of this book at all? No. No. It's, uh, it's fascinating. It's very long. And the central figure is a Palestinian from Nablus who goes to France right after, it's during and after 
the First World War. And so at that point, to go to Europe and to, you know, he has his um, uh, secondary school was in Istanbul, which they called Constantinople, very French. And so that was the way to be a cultured, successful person. And, but then he comes back to Nablus, and we have, over the passage of the years, how the society changes around him. Um, one big change, of course, is uh, Israel. But it ends before 1948. But you can see things changing uh, over the course of this life. So that was... That was something that I really enjoyed reading, and I ended up buying some soap from Nablus. Uh, <laughs> and um, then there's, let me uh, mention one other book by Sadia Hartman, and it's called Wayward Lives, Beautiful Experiments. And uh, Sadia Hartman is a poet and a literary critic. And this book is about the invisible working class black women in Philadelphia and New York in the early 20th century. And she has spoken of it as a history. Well, she's made up a lot of it, so I'm not ready to go with her as a history, but it's a fantastic evocation. I think it might be called a novel. It's absolutely gorgeous, and it makes you think um, second and third times about the people who don't appear in history. So um, Wayward Lives, Beautiful Experiments. So do you have a suggestion for me? I can read French. Thank you for those uh, suggestions. Uh, the, the, the book, The Parisian, looks uh, very interesting to me and to uh, my, my, my topics of, uh, of uh, interest. Um, the book I was thinking of was is called um, uh, Before Homosexuality. Huh. It has been uh, uh, written by um, Khaled Arwayheb. So I'm going to write that down in commentaries if I can. Arwayheb. And it's a book uh, dealing with uh, all oh, yes. gender, gender and sexual um identities, minority identities uh -huh. in the Muslim world before colonization uh -huh. uh, uh, from Europe uh -huh. and before that, you know, implementation of that binary mo uh, model like yes. you're queer or yes. you're straight, yes. you're yes. white, you're black, yes. you're Western, you're Eastern. So yes. uh, before we had, it seems that we, we had so much more diversity, so much yes. more inclusiveness. Yes. It was not perfect, of course. Yes. I'm not right, right, right. here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Islam and the, the Turkish Empire was no. It was also problematic in, in yes. many ways. It was not as fascistic and binary as in the West. Uh -huh. So that's that's a very very interesting book because it takes that topic of of gender diversity. Mm -hmm. But in the end, it makes it a bigger picture about diversity and equality or, uh -huh. or, or uh, dialogue and negotiation, yes. identity yes. negotiation yes. in the Arab Muslim societies and Turkish societies before colonization, before modernity, in a way. Ah, uh -huh. okay, good. Thank you. Uh, yeah. the, 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 the guy who wrote it is a psychoanalyst, yeah. but it's of anthropological, historical, religious uh, perspectives, yeah. full of very, very uh, uh, interesting and also humoristic uh, anecdotes about, um, you know, people living their life and affirming oh, who good, they are. Good, good, good. You know, it, it's a beautiful book, beautiful. Very easy to read, but very academic in a way that it, it, it's full of references. So That's I love okay that. That's with me. <laughs> Academic is okay with me. <laughs> it's also in French, but of course they named it in French uh, L'amour des garçons, ah. which is completely missing the point, you know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because it's not about before what happened before colonization, but now it's, it's more of a homoerotic perspective that they're putting yes. forward uh, with that title. Yes. And it's you know, just... just that is telling us so much about the academic um, sphere uh, in, in France. You know? And marketing, 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 marketing. Yeah. Yes, yes. Yeah. 
All right. Well, I think we've uh, we've met. <laughs> it was my first blind date. I was happy to share it with you. <laughs> Me too. I have never been on a blind date before. <laughs> <laughs> and I think, I think I wouldn't trust the kind of way that people date now because they don't have people vetting their people. So, you know, you had, you were chosen by Cedric and David, they, they say you're okay. And they said that I'm okay too. But imagine just going out in the world and being defenseless. Hmm, I would like to have to do that. <laughs> yes, yes, and especially with what you said before, you know, what do you have to sell? What, what, what can I buy for you, from you? So it, it, it's turning into that very much. So the transactions. Yeah, yeah it's frightening. I was married. I'm divorced. So I, I'm into that market now. So yeah, I'm having a lot oh, of Oh, you are. <laughs> How do you manage it? Actually, I was married to a, a South African that I met when I was finishing my PhD in South Africa in Cape Town. So I was a uh, working as a, sorry? A woman? It was You're a married man. married to a woman? To a man. A woman? A man? A man. <laughs> did you marry a woman? A man? A trans? A Who did you marry? A man. man. <laughs> okay, got it. Yeah. <laughs> The sound is not good anymore. I know, it's probably, I'm up here in the mountains and um, my connection has been iffy uh, before. Okay. Yeah, so that was your it first. Is, it was, yes, yes, it was a beautiful, beautiful person, beautiful relationship, but then I divorced and I came back to Marseille. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> to make yeah. it short. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and then you did it again. Uh, not yet, because now I'm more uh, thoughtful about marriage. You know, it's a big commitment, you know? Yes. <laughs> so, yeah, I'm taking my time. But I hope one day, yeah. Yeah, I hope one day. We'll see. Well, you, your work is a good way to find the right person. Someone my, who's engaged in the kind of work, the kind of values you have. Yes, and then uh, you 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 come back at home and you work you work again. You talk. Oh, oh, all right. You bring it with you all you know? the time. Okay. You know, so that was one of the issues. Or you yeah. find someone who's uh, who's not understanding what you're doing, and yeah, and then, so, yeah. Oh, um, that's hard. Yeah, we'll see. We'll see. That's why I'm tending to to work less, to travel less, and to to get a life on my own. <laughs> <now>. <laughs> Here's to life. <laughs> that might be my new, new Your beginning. New beginning. Yeah. Anyway, I wish you well. I wish you well. Thank you. Thank you. Anyway, it was lovely to talk to you. Indeed. Really. Thank you so much, Nell. And so uh, maybe, maybe one day we will meet again in the real world. Who knows? Yes. Uh, well, in Marseille, you don't want to come to the U.S. now. You probably can't come to the U.S. now. I probably can't. No, last time no. I, I came for a conference, I was checked at the yeah. at the border for uh, two hours. <laughs> oh, it's disgusting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It makes me okay. want to stay more in Europe. It's not yeah. perfect, but yeah. Welcome to Marseille, anytime. Okay, thank you. Welcome. See you soon. Okay. Take care. Au revoir. Au revoir. <laughs> David.